massive theft of property at Hunan Music Festival sparks viral trend. An article calls for the urgent freezing of private enterprise assets, people are worried that the CCP will kill everyone. Chinese tech talent increasingly leaving, not necessarily for the United States. Another abandoned industry in China, Xi's impromptu governance leads to failure. Female writer criticizes Su Jiayin, he doesn't know his worth and wives a luxurious and indulgent lifestyle. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Massive theft of property at Hunan Music Festival sparks viral trend. On October 4, a string of organized thefts took place during the mini music festival held in Nanyang, Hunan. Many attendees reported that a significant number of belongings were stolen on site, including camping tents, sleeping bags, chairs, camping vehicles, iPhones, iPads, power banks, bank cards, cash, and even clothing, shoes, and underwear, all gone missing. Some netizens reported seeing numerous villagers from nearby areas gathered around the campsite with tricycles and electric scooters, each loaded with stolen items. One victim posted, Many things were stolen collectively, and many people took things right in front of us. Tents were all dismantled, and things were damaged. I don't think anyone will take responsibility for all the losses. That's it, I'm exhausted. I'm leaving Nanyang. Another said, They even stole my enthusiasm. I've never felt so helpless and frustrated, and I'm in tears, or dozens of our tents, luggage, as well as alcohol, tables, chairs, everything was stolen. I've never been this speechless in my life. Victims described their losses, which ranged from thousands to hundreds of thousands of Chinese yuan. On the evening of October 3, the Central Plains Mini Music Festival Organizing Committee issued a notice stating that regarding the theft cases during the music festival, the photos and video information of some relevant thieves would be handed over to the police for further investigation. Commenting on this matter, some netizens joked that, this is the Chinese version of zero-cost shopping. It's truly embarrassing. Just a few days ago, there was news of Nanyang city leaders welcoming music fans at the train station and now they have a slap in the face, and the police were derelict in their duties. An article calls for the urgent freezing of private enterprise assets, people are worried that the CCP will kill everyone. China's real estate industry has nearly collapsed, and local governments are grappling with payroll issues as the looming specter of an impending economic crisis draws nearer. Mounting concerns indicate that China might be on the cusp of entering an era characterized by wealth confiscation. Against this backdrop, an article by Professor Zhang Hongliang, a prominent leftist scholar, featuring the provocative title China must immediately freeze private enterprise assets, every delay of a minute and a second will increase enormous damage, has garnered significant attention. In more detail, within the article, Zhang expounded upon the exposure of models exemplified by Evergrande and Country Garden, illuminating the strategies employed by thousands of private enterprise proprietors in China to transform their corporate assets into personal holdings and shift Chinese assets into foreign domains. He articulated a sense of urgency, with an escalating number of private entrepreneurs poised to hastily transfer their assets overseas. Consequently, he urged the government to promptly freeze private enterprise assets, emphasizing that every moment's delay, even a mere minute or second, would precipitate considerable harm. This article swiftly garnered attention and sparked criticism from online users, leading to its removal from several forums and websites. Nevertheless, lingering concerns persist among external observers. Providing trouble for Xi Jinping? According to Gao Yu, a veteran media figure in Beijing, Zhang Holian's article exposes his deep-seated hostility towards entrepreneurs. She argues that this is causing trouble for Xi Jinping. The three-year-long pandemic has left numerous private enterprises in a state of suspension, resulting in youth unemployment. Only the revival of private enterprises can address the unemployment crisis. Now, Zhang Hongliang, with his proletarian liberation of the world mindset, talks about confiscating private enterprise capital, revealing his true Maoist nature. In reality, he is also causing trouble for Xi Jinping, otherwise, Zhang Holiang's article wouldn't have been removed so swiftly. Is the CCP testing the waters? Addressing this situation with Radio Free Asia, RFA, 
commentator Dong Guo cautioned against underestimating articles by figures like Zhang Hongliang and underscored the significance of Mao Zedong's portrait appearing during this year's October 1 celebrations. He contended, in China, individuals designated as expert professors and scholars frequently articulate the perspectives of specific interest groups. Such articles aren't composed casually. They must align with the preferences of higher authorities to be published, as government policy is tailored in response to situational exigencies. Moreover, there have been recent signs of financial difficulties within the CCP. Even several district governments in Beijing are facing budgetary constraints. The Evergrande crisis is anticipated to set off a chain of real estate crises, posing a significant threat to the banking system. Since last year, state-owned banks in major cities such as Shenzhen and Shanghai have imposed limitations on depositors' withdrawals. Recently, even rural commercial banks, like the one in Haishan Town, Raoping County, Chaoshan City, Guangdong Province, have faced issues. A few years back, these rural commercial banks enticed villagers to buy shares, promising dividend payouts. However, for the past eight years, not only have villagers failed to receive any dividends, but now they are unable to recover their principal investments. According to U.S.-based economist Li Hengqing, a substantial portion of the bank's funds has been poured into the real estate sector. Currently, a significant volume of bank loans has transformed into bad debts, and the entire banking system is perched on the edge of a volcano. The government is doing everything it can to conceal this fact. She further added, we are just one step away from a bank run. If everyone rushes to the banks to withdraw their money, it will spell disaster. Given this situation, there are concerns that the authorities might revisit the past practice of confiscating entrepreneurs' assets. Ms. Zhang, the head of a foreign trade processing enterprise in Shenzhen, expressed great concern to RFA that Zhang Holiang's assertion of freezing private enterprise assets has become a reality. Perhaps someone is testing the public's response. Many policies are typically tested first, and if the reaction is too strong or some people oppose it, they dare not proceed. My grandparents' assets were confiscated during the public-private partnership, and eventually, the government assigned them a job. Many policies are implemented step by step. Many years ago, in September 2018, Wu Xiaoping, who claimed to be a senior financial figure, published an article titled China's Private Economy has completed the task of assisting the development of the public economy and should gradually exit, which also stirred public opinion. Many people immediately linked this article to Alibaba Chairman Jack Ma's retirement announcement, suspicions of sexual assault involving JD CEO Lu Qiangdong, and a series of incidents related to Chinese private enterprises, such as the death of HNA Chairman Wang Jian in France. They believe that this article served as a testing the waters scenario for Beijing's intention to take action against private enterprises. Subsequently, even though the private economy did not withdraw, companies like Alibaba, Tencent, Didi, and others faced a series of socialist iron fists and were repeatedly subjected to regulatory crackdowns. Chinese tech talent increasingly leaving, not necessarily for the United States. In recent years, the pace of Chinese emigration overseas has been steadily increasing. According to reports from the U.S. media, the number of immigrants in the first three quarters of this year has already matched the total for the previous year, with a significant trend among tech talents. However, these top talents are not primarily choosing the United States as their preferred destination. In detail, the New York Times reported on October 3 that during China's poorest periods in the 1980s and 1990s, many of the country's most outstanding talents sought employment and work opportunities in the West. In 1992 alone, as many as 870,000 people left China. However, by 2012, due to China's economic development and policies in Beijing aimed at retaining talent, the number of emigrants had dropped to 125,000. Nevertheless, there was a significant reversal in the situation last year. Despite passport and travel restrictions, the number of Chinese emigrants exceeded 310,000. The cumulative figure for the first three quarters of this year has already matched that of the previous year. 
the article points out that many of these individuals considered emigration after China's constitutional amendment in 2018 removed presidential term limits. The three-year-long zero-COVID policy during the COVID-19 pandemic was the final straw that motivated them to make the decision. Chen Liangshu, who formerly conducted research in artificial intelligence at Baidu and Alibaba and now works for Meta in the UK, expressed that he left China three and a half years ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic. He explained that he didn't like the social and political environment there, and he won't go back until there is democracy in China and people can live without worries. Mr. Zhao, who grew up in a poor rural area in Shandong, said that when he went to the United States to pursue a PhD in engineering five years ago, he originally planned to return to China after graduation. However, China's response to the COVID-19 pandemic raised doubts in his mind, stating that he cannot go back to a country built on lies. The report points out that most of these Chinese professionals choose to go to developed countries other than the United States because the process of applying for visas and permanent residency in the United States is both complex and uncertain. In addition to tech talents, affluent individuals from China are also increasing their efforts to emigrate. According to the UK's Financial Times, well-known immigration lawyer David Lesperance quickly received instructions from three ultra-high-net-worth Chinese business families to initiate their escape plans after Xi Jinping secured his third term. At the same time, Shanghai experienced a surge in luxury home sales, with some properties being sold at prices as much as 30% below market value. Furthermore, in cities such as Wuhan, Beijing, Jiangsu, and Zhujiang, many affluent individuals have started selling off assets, and numerous Taiwanese business people are divesting their businesses or transferring ownership. As previously reported, data from investment immigration consultancy firm Henley and Partners estimates that in 2022, around 10,000 high net worth residents attempted to withdraw $48 billion from China, making it the second largest population and wealth outflow after Russia. Experts stated that the departure of people and capital will have a clear cost to the Chinese economy. However, it's important to mention that leaving China has become increasingly challenging in recent times. Reports have emerged of passport confiscations at Chinese customs during departures, as some internet users have claimed. Additionally, more and more foreign banks are gradually exiting the Chinese market, making it difficult for these wealthy individuals to transfer their money overseas. In August of this year, there were reports that he may, the chairman of Shanghai's largest Sino-US immigration intermediary company, Weilian Group, was arrested by Shanghai authorities. According to insider information, the police demanded that he may hand over all customer information related to immigration services over the past several decades. Some analysts believe that the CCP intends to investigate all wealthy individuals who have left the country. Another abandoned industry in China, Xi's impromptu governance leads to failure. In 2014, Tesla began delivering its first batch of electric vehicles in the Chinese market. The Chinese Communist Party swiftly followed suit by introducing subsidies for the electric vehicle industry, which triggered a surge of new companies entering the market, including NIO, Xpeng, Iwais, and WM Motor. By 2018, the electric vehicle industry had reached its zenith, with over 400 companies in operation. However, after 2019, the tide began to recede, and most electric vehicle companies found themselves grappling with closures or financial crises. According to statistics, there are now only around 10 electric vehicle companies left in China that continue to manufacture and sell their products. This year, as competition in the automotive market has intensified, the electric vehicle industry has entered a new phase of restructuring. In September, WM Motor, once one of the big three electric vehicle companies, abruptly canceled its plans to list on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. In July, Iways, a company that had not yet produced a single vehicle, declared bankruptcy. During the same month, Skywell New Energy Vehicle Group was officially designated as a dishonest debtor by the Tsishi City Court. In May, the Human Resources Department of Aichi Auto once again notified employees of delayed salary payments. From the initial rush to establish electric vehicle companies to the current wave of eliminations, 
many previously highly regarded electric vehicle projects backed by local governments have been abandoned, leading to the emergence of electric vehicle graveyards in several Chinese cities, numbering in the hundreds to thousands. According to veteran media personality Shibata Akio, these graveyards contain countless abandoned electric vehicles, left to rust in remote parking lots and along riverbanks, some even hidden beneath overgrown vegetation. Many of these electric vehicles still bear the remnants of their previous owners, such as dolls and small decorations, but the majority of their batteries have been removed, resulting in considerable environmental damage. This chaotic situation can be traced back to the substantial subsidies that the Chinese government introduced for electric vehicles many years ago. Not the electric vehicle, Mr. Akio also mentioned the promotion of shared bicycles. At that time, the CCP had introduced various incentive mechanisms. However, once numerous companies entered the market, they discovered that conducting business was nearly impossible. Within a few years, they began to withdraw one after another. The discarded shared bicycles littered parks, riverbanks, and remote wilderness areas, giving rise to numerous bicycle graveyards. This phenomenon also garnered global media attention at the time. Mr. Akio further emphasized that, whether it pertained to electric vehicles or shared bicycles, the initial ideas were promising. However, the primary reason for their failure in China was attributed to the Xi Jinping regime's failure to conduct thorough market research and its overly ambitious pursuit of rapid results, disregards analytical reports from the bureaucratic system and makes impulsive decisions. The existence of electric vehicle graveyards and shared bicycle graveyards serves as visible consequences of policy failures. Female writer criticizes Su Jiain. He doesn't know his worth and lives a luxurious and indulgent lifestyle. After the downfall of Su Jiain, the chairman of China Evergrande Group, various scandals related to the Evergrande Empire have gradually come to light. Recently, a mainland Chinese female writer, Chen Lan, wrote a lengthy article revealing details of Su Jiain's past interactions with people, describing his extravagant lifestyle. Chen Lan wrote on her post on Weibo that she had carefully reviewed a lot of information about Su Jiain in recent days. She mentioned an encounter between Su Jiain and Ma Weidu, a writer and screenwriter known as the number one collector in Beijing. Ma Weidu portrayed Su Jiain as a person like a black hole, a giant baby, and a madman, vividly illustrating his character. Su Jiain appeared in front of Ma in sportswear. Just as he approached, he shrugged his shoulders, and whoosh, his coat slipped off his body, and the person behind him happened to catch it. Sitting in front of Ma Weidu, Su Jiain raised his hand, and a cigar was placed between his fingers. Pop, light the fire. He took a few puffs, leaned back, and the person behind him took the cigar away. Tap, tap, they knocked off the ashes. On this side, Su Jiain raised his hand again, and the cigar was back in place. Su Jiain bragged, saying, Most people who work out are just fooling around, but I hired a coach from the United States. Chen Lan's article states that she believed any rational and normal person in a civilized society, upon witnessing these actions, would readily recognize that these individuals consider themselves akin to gods and religious leaders. A psychological assessment suggests that this individual has lost touch with reality. Su Jiain no longer knows who he is or even how much he weighs. The article also mentions rumors circulating in certain circles that Su Jiain doesn't allow outsiders to approach within 10 meters of him, insists on drinking specific water, and requires shoes to be prepared in advance. The company prioritizes building relationships over production and even arranges special performances to entertain clients, claiming to be of Su Emperor's bloodline. In an accompanying image within the article, it is revealed that Evergrande executives lead a lavish and extravagant lifestyle comparable to that of an emperor. After seeing this, it becomes clearer why Evergrande is burdened with a debt of 2 trillion yuan. The image also illustrates the accommodation requirements, including the availability of a spa, specific types of fruit, and even the snacks consumed by leaders from Evergrande Group headquarters, the real estate group, Evergrande hotels, car companies, and other places. These details are meticulously compiled into tables by assistants.
Chen Lan's blog post has been widely circulated among many netizens. They left comments as follows. Upon reading the news about Boss Su, I suddenly realized that most real estate in China is essentially a financial Ponzi scheme, borrowing money to pay off old debts with new funds. The house is just a vehicle, and some individuals within the Ponzi scheme make a lot of money. The final major creditor becomes a victim of the Ponzi. Evergrande has a strict internal system, and it is even more bureaucratic than government bureaucracies, taking advantage of external factors to deceive people into buying houses and fooling downstream contractors into providing advance payments. With Xia Haijun, vice chairman of the board of directors of Evergrande Group, receiving an annual salary of 270 million yuan and the enormous dividends from Evergrande Group, one can ascertain how much of the 2.44 trillion yuan debt they stashed away and how much of it they squandered. The comprehensive records of Evergrande Group's leaders' guest history had been exposed online around the time of Evergrande Group's financial turmoil in 2021. However, people were unaware at the time that Evergrande Group's total debt had exceeded 2.4 trillion yuan. Now that the table has resurfaced, some netizens have suggested that for these individuals who revel in luxury all night, they should be apprehended and made to experience life behind bars. Don't forget to comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths.